Okay, so yeah, the last bonus video. <laughs> uh, as we do, we'll go through all the missions and we'll check out all the videos and lectures that we didn't see. And yeah, so starting now, we're having the Daniel of Moscow. In the 13th century, Moscow had fallen to the Mongol invasion and rebuilt itself from the ashes. But of all Rus', uh, Rus principalities, Moscow was still one of the smallest and least powerful. Uh, that is, until a new prince came to the throne. 1272 saw Daniel Alexandrovich, the youngest son of the Rus', the Rus hero Alexander Nevsky, assume full power as prince of Moscow. Uh, from humble beginnings, Daniel increased in Moscow's influence through diplomatic alliances and strong city defenses. An exemplar for peaceful solution, he is known only to have participated in one battle. By the end of Daniel's reign, he controlled the land of Moscow, uh, Moscow River, igniting Moscow ascendancy from city to state. Daniel's descendant will in turn rise to become the most powerful princes of the Rus domain, cementing Moscow dynastic claim to rule. All right, yeah, that's what we saw. And the horse archers, it's a unit that I've not even built the whole campaign. It was just not interesting. It was not like in the Mekanai where I had to deal with the units. This time it was not that useful, but we'll see the video. Horse archers were elite troops who galloped into battle, shooting their bows from the saddle, arrow after arrow after arrow. The key to horse archery is being able to fit an arrow to the string, draw it back, and release very, very quickly. Horse archers use a special device called a thumb ring, and this gives us a special technique to lock the arrow onto the bow and shoot. With the thumb draw, the arrow is placed on the right-hand side of the bow. And so taking an arrow from the quiver and onto the string was extremely efficient, allowing horse archers to shoot in rapid succession. The three main shots are the forward shot, the side shot, and the back shot, also called the Parthian shot. Both Moscow and the Mongols had a horse archery tradition that stretched back for centuries. Their armies were well matched with these light and versatile troops, and their conflicts were characterized by the horse archers' fluid style of warfare. Horse archers were famed for their surprise attacks. In Moscow's armies, they could be deployed rapidly in many different terrains, and then appear as if from nowhere. In addition to being expert with their bows, they used both javelins and swords for close quarter fighting. Attacks could come from any side, so horse archers had to shoot both left and right-handed. Shots taken behind the head offered additional variety in the angles of attack. They were also expert at swarming across an enemy's front to decimate his lines. They were quick to retreat and just as quick to renew their attacks. Horse archers were Moscow's crack troops. They patrolled the borders and held them against invaders. Yeah, pretty much as the Manganai, the uh, horse archers were like the elite units, um, the, the elite soldier, soldiers, because the um, like in the game they are just shooting, but in the real life they were like they had to be uh, to be like both uh, able to shoot left and right using their their left and right hands, but also like they they also have to be able to fight with a sword with a spear. We're doing all of that, so they were like elite soldiers for sure. 
All right, uh, tributes. We the uh, city to city. No, city to state force of in Kremlins. I think we saw this one. So let's see this one. City to state. By 1303, Moscow controlled land that encompassed the entire flow of the Moskva River. Its ambitions didn't end there. Moscow continued to expand its borders through its wealth rather than warfare. Its tactic was to buy land from bankrupt rulers, acquiring entire towns and villages in the process. Yeah, we saw that. <laughs> With the wolves, I was not so sure, but yeah, now I remember. So it's forts in Kremlins that we didn't see. Huh. Medieval Moscow, Muscovy, was shielded by vast forests, which slowed the advance of approaching enemies. These woodlands were also an abundant source of timber for building wooden forts. Forts built within urban settlements were called Kremlins. The original Kremlin in Moscow, from at least the 12th century, was made entirely from wood, as were all buildings in the city. To understand how these forts were constructed, a scaled-down version is being made. Moscow built forts in vast numbers. You can see they had an ingenious way of doing it. These standard lengths of wood have V-shaped notches cut into the end, and then they can be simply overlaid into a box construction which forms a cell. No joints, no nails, just the sheer weight will keep them in place. Stacked together both vertically and side by side, these cells created astonishingly resilient walls. They were far better at withstanding attacks from mighty siege engines than simple vertical palisades. And the box construction of Muscovy forts also had a number of other advantages. By filling them with earth or with stone, it made them not only stronger than a single wooden palisade, but it also gave them sturdiness and elasticity, which could better absorb the impact of projectiles from trebuchets. And the other advantage of these box structures is that they could be prefabricated. Now, the first step in that process is taking off the bark. This stops wood-eating insects from sheltering beneath the bark and allows the wood to dry, preventing it from rotting. By taking off the bark, this wood could then last for years. Prepared timbers could be stored and then assembled into cells, wherever and whenever needed. And some cells, both on the walls and the gatehouse towers, were not filled with earth. Instead, they were left empty for defenders to use. From the 13th century, some towers were made of stone and brick, like this one at Chertsk Castle, built in 1388. When stone wasn't available locally, red brick was the material of choice. Of course, the advantage of using bricks is that they're easy and cheap to manufacture, they're uniform, so easy to build with, and it's these red bricks which give the distinctive look to Eastern European castles, which we can still see to this day. Stone and brick towers could be built much taller than wooden ones. This allowed Moscow's defenders to spot potential attackers sooner, keeping their enemies at bay. All right, very cool, very cool. Um, no idea how to pronounce this. Oshkinivniki, stalking the trade routes of medieval Russia where bands of roaming pirates, known as Ushikiniki. Although they were a few in number, their attack sh uh, will shake the very foundation of mongol Rus relations. Time and again, these bandits seize the vital uh, silver shipments, capture entire towns and controlled river transport. They raided merchants uh, for their, boot their, their booty and sold it on for profit. 
Uh, soon the flow of silver all but dried up, spelling disaster for the Rust Princes as they began to miss their tribute payments to the Horde. The threat of Mongols' retribution drew even closer. The desperate princes try again and again to stop the bandits' raid and reestablish safe trade routes, but therefore fail to keep flavor with the can. So those patience will not hold much longer. As we saw, like this was the mission where we had to um, like to build cities and stuff, and we were fighting uh, bandits all over the place. They were just spawning all over the place, honestly. <laughs> it was quite difficult to handle them, exactly. Um, okay, this one. The battle to Kodikovo. It is, we saw this one. Let's see this one. The same Dimitri. Dunsko. Dunske? No idea how to pronounce this. <laughs> Grand Prince, Grand Prince uh, Dimitri did not always have easy relationship uh, relations with the Arax er of the Orthodox Church, but his great victory at Kulikovo made of a, made of him a national hero. One graded it even today with turning the tide of the uh, in the struggle for Rus independence f uh, from the Golden Heart. Yeah, as we saw, legend grew around the battle, including the story that the, the venerable Habat Serge of Radonis that's yeah that's it <laughs> bless the prince and set it his two bravest monks into battle with Dimitri to inspire the troops and provide spiritual legitimacy to the fight still the Russian Orthodox Church did not so soon forget for Dimitri conflicts with the religious leaders of his own time it was only in 1288, so very recently, some 600 years after his great victory, that the church made Dmitry Donsko a saint, giving him religion structures to match his historical, uh, historical and cultural importance. That's quite late, I don't know. <laughs> um, sword and sabers. The might of medieval Moscow was powered by strong arms and an unbreakable fighting spirit. Fighting with a sword and shield, eye to eye in a gritty and brutal contest, was the European way. And swords in Moscow developed along the same lines as they did in Western Europe. This is a typical sword of around 1400. It's got a broad, double-edged blade, a simple crossguard, and this heavy pommel counterbalances the blade. They were so well balanced that these powerful medieval swords were capable of being wielded with great speed and fluidity. By the 14th century, improvements in the manufacture of iron made it possible to fashion swords with longer blades. And swords like this, requiring two hands to wield, became more and more common on the battlefield. They were called long swords, and they were used with sophisticated martial techniques. It does have incredible and terrifying power. But there was another influence on Moscow. Moscow traded with the East, and Moscow fought with the East. And it was from the East that Moscow adopted the saber, with its distinctively curved blade. The curve on a saber blade gives a natural slice to the cut, so cutting deeper for less effort. These exceptionally light swords were first and foremost a horseman's weapon. As a single strike weapon, using the speed of the horse for impact, it was one cut onto the next. But cutting wasn't their only use. Even with a curved blade, you can still deliver an effective thrust. <laughs> However, for all their cavalry dash, the old ways of standing firm remained part of the Muscovy way. Forging a military culture that was a unique blend of West and East. Hmm, interesting. Interesting, I didn't know that. 
Um, I don't know what the saber was. I don't know what the sword was, but I didn't know like the Rus was using both, both weapons. Interesting. Okay, state to empire. We saw this. Uh, the empire falters. Page from history. The empire falters. The vast part and powerful Mongols empire had he held Muscovy in his grips for almost two centuries. But despite his might, the empire was not immune to civil war. Genghis Khan's grandsons in the east and, and had fought bitterly for the title of Great Khan, and later in the west, competing branches of the family uh, scrambled for supremacy over Russia, Persia, and the Crimea. Khan took a mish of the Golden Heart became embroiled in a long series of violent conflicts with his former supporters. Timur, the dominant Khan in the Middle East. Timur was strong and the war was devastating for uh, Tokhtamish. He lost his army, his, uh, his capital and was eventually forced to flee. As the remnant of the Golden Heart fought with no uh, neighboring Khanates, uh, the time has, had come for Muscovy to seize open the weakness uh, of his long standing overlords, as we saw. <laughs> the Horde, yeah. The face of battle. Among both the armies of Moscow and the Golden Horde were strange looking creatures. Grotesque, sinister faces that struck terror into a foe. There's a very long history of making helmets with mask visors, with human features, in the ancient Near East. Moscow was heavily influenced by this metalworking tradition, using the art of embossing to hammer these extraordinary sculptural forms into the steel. To make these masks required highly skilled artisans. In present-day Poland, Adam Mazia is a master of the craft. The process begins with a thick, flat sheet of wrought iron. The hammer stretches and domes the plate. The beginnings of a face. As the metal is pushed out, it becomes thinner and so easier to work. Adam marks a center point and an outline of the nose. This is the only guide he uses all else is done by I alone. In Western Europe during the late Middle Ages, helmet design was all about function. What shapes are going to form glancing surfaces that make weapons skate and bounce away from the face? In Moscow, however, the approach was rather different. They sacrificed quite a lot of protection for the sake of extraordinary visual impact. There is a limit to which the metal can be stretched, and so a slot is cut to allow the nose to be shaped. Released from the bonds of the rigid plate, the nose takes on its distinctive form. In a way, armor is always a mask. It forces the world to see us as we want to be seen. Strong, powerful, indomitable. These Muscovite mask visors are an extraordinary example of that projection of identity. In some cases, they were actually made as portraits in the image of the wearer. With every strike, the features become more and more recognizably human. The furnace imbues the mask with a warrior's fury. When finished, the visor is given a high polish and attached to its helmet with this rotating hinge that allows the visor to be raised and stowed when not in use. But it can always be quickly lowered as soon as danger threatens. A man could project his power with such a mask. A man could hide his fear with such a mask. And by doing so, he could be brave. Yeah, we saw a couple of those uh, during the cutscenes in the later one. Uh, fall of 
Novgorod Republic. We saw this one. Okay, let's see this. Uh, Marfa the Mayores. Marfa the Mayores of Novgorod is recorded by Istrik both as a legendary people hero and a treasonous heretic. As uh, Novgorod withstood a decade of attempts to bring it up, uh, bring it under Muscovite control. It was Marfa, the widow of Novgorod Mayor, who has elevated the as the uh, charismatic letter of the Republic, extending his defiance to the rule of the all-powerful Terran of Moscow, uh, Moscow Haven III. Meanwhile, the Russian Orthodox uh, Church feared the spread of Catholicism into Muscovy and so balk at Novgorod friendly dealings with Western rulers. The church needed a real world demon of, on which to blame his uh, devilry, Marfa. Being a wealthy and powerful woman became their, their target. After Novgorod finally fell to Moscow, Marfa was exiled, her lands confiscated, and she faded uh, from the historical record. Little is known about the real Marfa, but her twins' legends live on in folklore. Interesting. A great river. Um. <laughs> the great stand of the great river. We saw this one. This one. See this one. The cannon yard. Across the banks of the Ugrak River, the Mongols' army shared down their barrel of uh, Evans the third formidable array of cannons and retreated. Uh, it was the final stand and display of mind that shook that shook Muscovy free from its conquerors. Under Haven the third, Ross firepower advanced even more rapidly. Uh, where before the Ross has adopted uh, the, single, the simple guns of their neighbors and used them only to defend against siege, Moscow now had his own cannons guard, a great foundry where huge cannon was, uh, were cast in bronze and mobilized uh, with carriage wheels. Now they could be brought into the battlefield. They power shattered stones, walls, and bringing cities to their knees. Muscovite cannons, cannons will continue evolving uh, to enormous scale and stand as an imposing symbol of the military might of the Rus. Yeah. Uh, the harvest. From long harsh winters to Mongol invasions, life for Muscovite peasants was tough. But they had one crop that was vital to their survival. Rye. Moscow peasants relied on cereal crops more than any other food. To separate the grain from the straw, cereals had to be threshed with a flail. This tool could also be repurposed for battle. When the Grand Prince called upon peasants to serve in the army, they would have become armed with their tools of the trade, their pitchforks and their pikes, but chief amongst their weapons would be the flail. Farming crops in a land that was covered in snow for six months of the year was challenging. But rye was one crop that was particularly adapted to the extreme Moscow climate. The thing about rye is it's incredibly hardy. If you can sow it in autumn, it'll grow through the winter months, even with a covering of snow on the ground. Now, Russia is famous for its long, cold winters, but it also gets very hot and dry summers, and it's in those drought conditions that rye also thrives. And it's for that reason that a majority of Moscow peasants were growing this stuff. But they didn't get to keep all of their crop. The largest rye grains were given to the Grand Princes as tax while the rest would be used to make bread or malted to make a nourishing non-alcoholic drink, kvass. It's super easy to make and, yeah. and, and cheap, really cheap. It's great for helping tired muscles recover and it's just quite refreshing and also helps control infections. Muscovite soldiers drank kvass as part of their daily rations. It's made by first adding ground malted rye to boiling water. After cooling, yeast culture is added, causing the mixture to ferment. This kills off any germs in the water. There you go. Around three days later, the kvass is ready to drink. 
the bubbles are really starting to come up now. Yeah. Just the yeast doing its work. На здоровье. На здоровье. What are the special qualities of this drink then? It's essentially probiotic drink. It has a lot of B vitamins and it has lactic acid, which is great for recovering from hard labor. It's, it's kind of an ideal sports drink, really. And with rye so easy to grow, you can see how this was the sort of savior, if you like, of the, of the Moscow peasantry. The hardiness and versatility of rye was a lifesaver to Muscovites, both for peasants at home and soldiers on campaign. Okay, cool, interesting. Keep going, keep going. Um, Empire to superpower. And we'll see this one. Prosperity and power. In 1488, at the Cathedral of, Assum of the Assumptions, one of the most grandiose spectal uh, spectacles uh, of the age took place. The coronation of Ivan III grandson, Dmitry Ivanovich, as Grand Prince of Mons Moscow and a heir to Evan's title of the Grand Prince of All Rus. The building was adorned with gleaming cupola domes. It boosts an in, uh, innovative uh, blend of traditional and renaissance architecture and inside an imposing wall of rich, richly painted religious icons loom over the congregation. congregation. The lavish Ness of the ceremony was designed by Evan the Third's ministers to establish beyond doubt the Moscow's place as a center of Rus power. Demon III the grandson eventually lost his place as the as heir to his uncle Vasily and will spend the rest of his days in prison. Nevertheless, Evan continued to use a elaborate ceremony and ornate monuments to celebrate Moscow ascendancy. His legacy of power and spectacle uh, will earn him the, the post humor humus moniker of Evan the Great. And the last one Empire to Strike the Siege of Kazan. We see this one. We'll see those two videos in this uh, lecture over there. Evan the Terrible. Evan's the fourth uh, victory over the Kazan. Uh, can it mark the beginning of Russian expansion across Asia? Whose uh, commemorate is great battle, even commissioned uh, to the construction of the most elaborate monument the world has ever seen, Saint Basil Cathedral in Moscow. But as even can paint farther and farther beyond its own diamond, the cost of maintaining its uh, spending was passing to the Rus people, crippling taxations soon bred discontent in the provinces. Certain that rebellion were, uh, was festering, even dispatched his fearsome private police to undone his political opponents and, in convince, convinced to their, uh, of their treachery, he also ordered the arrest or murder uh, or of any relatives who might one day challenge his own son's right to the throne. A generation later, Muscovy uh, was left with no viable heirs. The centuries-long dynasty that began with Daniel of Moscow had come to Kalamithus' hand. Hmm. That's sad. Okay. Uh... Shrelsey? Sh Shrelsey. Streltsy is the Russian word for shooters, and from the late 15th century, the armies of Moscow had included regular troops, armed with an arquebus, a standard firearm in all European armies at the time. This is an arquebus. It's an early type of musket. To load it, you put a charge of black powder down the barrel. The ammunition is a lead ball. A paper wad seals the charge. Then both ball and wad the rammed home tight. To shoot the gun, priming powder is placed in the pan. The priming is lit by a match. Now, a match was originally a length of cord soaked in saltpeter so that it burns slowly 
but continuously, and even in poor weather. When lit, this sends a flame through a small hole at the base of the barrel, which lights the main charge. One of the great advantages of the Arquebus was that the ammunition was inexpensive and easy to make. Molten lead was poured into a special mold. It cooled to a solid state in seconds, making it possible for vast quantities of lead balls to be produced. They were finished by trimming off the excess lead, which was known as a sprue. Strelsi received regular payment of both money and bread, and they lived with their families in purpose-built settlements called Slobody. Streltsy were a new type of army, ordinary troops recruited from tradespeople and farm workers. An early arquebus had an extremely heavy barrel. To shoot it with accuracy, the gun had to be steadied, and Streltsy had a unique solution. This is a type of axe called a bardiche, and for the Streltsy, it doubled as a gun rest. Arquebus men were usually vulnerable to cavalry. Even with experience, reloading takes time. And cavalry covers ground very speedily. Once you've shot, your position becomes perilous very, very quickly. However, with the scything power of a Bardiche, a Strelsi has at least the chance to withstand a cavalry onslaught. It took a brave cavalryman to ride into a hail of bullets, but an even braver one to face the horror of these axes. Over time, Moscow's armies recruited more and more men armed with guns. Inexpensive troops who changed the way war was waged. Hey, shoot at me! How dare you! And the last video. The Legacy of Muscovy. Ivan IV had broken through the walls of the ancient city of Kazan, and his army flooded the streets. They hunted down its defenders and their allies, and brutally sacked the city. Kazan had fallen to the unstoppable military might and strategic innovation of the Muscovite war machine. In the years that followed, Ivan IV waged war after war to bring vast new territories under Moscow's rule. By 1547, he had declared himself the first Tsar of all Russia. And his never-ending fight for territory set the course for those who ruled after him. Moscow was no longer a small fort on the banks of the Moskva River. It had survived centuries of Mongol oppression and wars with its neighbors. Its evolution from fort to city to state and to empire would continue. Moscow's rise transformed Russia into one of the world's greatest superpowers. Mother Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I really like all the campaigns in this game. Um... I feel like though I, there's two ways to see this like I feel like in the fiction way the story of the game was top-notch we learned so much from this I believe like from the videos that we see I believe that they did quite a lot of research and I um, yeah so I do trust of what it is do what they say like I think what I, everything that happened there was um, it's still a game right so it cannot be like 100% accurate, but like quite accurate for sure. I'm pretty sure like it was quite accurate for sure. Like, I don't know, like not 100%, but like kind of close, maybe. 
uh so like the story was very very good for the campaigns i think though for the gameplay it's a bit where it falls a bit like we didn't uh we didn't have a lot of of allies we didn't have a lot of we didn't even control any ships uh we didn't even fight like for example during like this a uh, campaign there from the rise of moscow i didn't fight any english french or like uh, abbasid or anything from like differently we just we just been fighting um the mongols and i think some of the uh, other like other faction of the same like the mirror of me like the other Russ like I think the bandits and in Lithuania I think they were a clone I don't know not a one hundred percent sure but I think they were clone of like the Russ if so and this in this scale I think is what what it lacks a bit like and uh, uh, it, it's where it, it lacks a bit in, in this sense I feel like it should have been it could have been maybe a bit a, more fun if the missions were a lot more different uh, like I don't know I think something like at the same time though it will probably break the fiction so that's probably the reason why they did that but like um it would have been foreign though for uh for the mechanics to show more of like like having maybe like a units and like you you like for example the cannons like you try or the mechanics you try to or any anything anything, anything like um like let's say like the super uh, the super the um musketeers you could have been nice if the beginning they expose the musketeers on, on what they are good at and like the the level and the mission is designed around them obviously it will not have been the same uh because probably that will be sacrificing maybe the the story value but still but still i think that's a bit of a lack inside of the campaigns but uh yeah, it's like a, a, a little duel there. It's either like you have like a mission where it's designed around the units and around like they having like something fun in the mission, like you having like allies, having uh, exposition of the units attributes and stuff like this, or you have you try to be super accurate with the story. Hmm. And I, that's the direction that he chose. I think that's good. I think that's good. I, I really like the, the campaign for sure. Hope you enjoy it as well. And yeah, I will probably play more of Age of Empires but like in the uh, multiplayer. If you've been there from the start, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And as always, take care and see you there. Ciao.